Hi guys, welcome back. So you're fairly well used to me doing dodgy stuff on the channel. However, this is probably a new level of um, sketchiness, to be honest. This is a Tuxing 300 bar PCP compressor. We're going to look at the filtration today. We're going to see how it works. We're going to check inside of it. I need to show you the power supply on these as well, because if you're not mechanically sympathetic, you probably ought to avoid these. I've also got my Ultimate Sporter action here. This is six or seven years old now, and this has only ever been filled with an FX track pump with very little in the way of filtration. So we're going to whip it apart, get the cylinder off, have a look inside for any signs of corrosion, any nasties inside of that. So yeah, we've got a fair bit to do, so let's get stuck in. Right then, guys, this is everything that you get in your box. Now, this one came through Amazon. It was on Prime Day. It was reduced. I've got a good deal on it. Now, I was quite familiar with what I was going to get. I was familiar with the downsides to the power supply. There's a few things that I need to show you on here that are pretty sketchy. Now, these compressors have been subject to a few British standards recalls. So most of that, though, is related to the power supply. Hence, I didn't buy the version with the power supply built into it. The power supplies are generally the weak point for a lot of these things. Having it built into the casing, of course, makes it slightly larger, a bit neater, mind, than having it all wired. However, should this power supply fail, it's going to be a lot easier for me just to buy a replacement aftermarket one, clip it all together. Now, going forward, we're probably going to end up making a little frame to hold all this together in one piece. Now, this is what you get in the box. So you've got your compressor itself, large power supply. This one came, of course, with a UK three pin plug on it. We've also got some jump leads to run off the car. So straight away, that indicates that this is a step down transformer. So 240 volts going in. You can also select 110 volts on the side. So depending on where you are in the world, 230 in, 110 in, steps it down to 12 volts. So quite handy if you wanted to run it off of a car battery. Now, this is going to be drawing probably 30 amps. You've got to be very careful, especially if you've got any modern cars, any real fancy modern stuff. I would be very, very careful and make sure, of course, that you've got them the right way around. Make sure you've got the polarity right before you even consider turning it on because it could cause you a world of pain. Right, so here's the airline that it comes with. We've got foster fits on both ends. They actually feel pretty stout, to be honest. We've got spiral sort of braiding around the outside, a spring braiding. Now, this actual fill line feels quite flimsy. However, they're readily available replacements. I may end up whipping the one off of my pump going forward. We've also got a very tiny little inline filter here that comes with these little desiccant type filters. They basically look like a great big fag, but they can be swapped out regularly. It also came with a few spare O-rings and things as well. Now this compressor, it says that there's no user serviceable parts inside, which I find hard to believe, but I'm not gonna pull it apart straight away. We'll get it running for a little while, see how it pans out. And if we get any problems, then we'll strip it and see how it goes. So. What we need to do now, though, is zoom in and I need to show you the power supply here. So this is the mains power supply for the compressor. The power in and the power out are incredibly dodgy. Now, these are the parts that previously failed British standards testing. This is looking like it's the revised version of it, and it's still equally as sketchy. Now, again, I knew what I was getting myself into. I am competent working with the electronics on this, and I'm also competent. I could rebuild that compressor, no bother. So if you're not mechanically sympathetic, you probably should avoid it. So I'm going to get you some close-up pictures of these, because underneath this little flip-up terminal here, we've actually got some pretty poor wire in here. We've also got some flyaway leads on the live here as well. So although you've got something of a dodgy cover we've actually got some exposed cabling here as well so these really do need something of a cable strain it really wants enclosing to make it a bit safer so i'm going to get you some pictures of them now right so currently you're looking at the power supply so this is the power in this is your mains power in and this is the 12 volt out that goes to the compressor itself now both of these, or all of these, should I say, have got screw down terminals on there, which in themselves are pretty good. They're pretty stout, but there is nothing in the way of a cable strain relief on here. As an absolute minimum, this really needs to be sort of zip tied to the frame, at least something like that, so that if you knock it, bash it, pull it, you're not going to whip these terminals straight out. But interestingly, on the live here, we've actually got some flyaway cables. So what that is, is where they've poorly stripped the outer sheathing off the cable. We've actually got some broken cables here that are spiking out the back here. Now, I've already sort of flattened them off a little bit. So when that's down, 
you can't quite touch them but blimey it is pretty dodgy this really needs rewiring i'm probably going to end up putting on some or some soldered terminals clean it all up make a decent job of that and then enclose this on a backboard so it can't be knocked and damaged but if you're mechanically sympathetic that's not really a problem having the screw on terminals like this it's easy to repair a cable to replace a cable and instead of using a plug adapter if you were elsewhere in the world and you needed a european plug for instance you could easily just swap out the whole lead and not just use a sketchy plug adapter so yeah it's very crude it's quite poorly done but for someone like me who can do this we can repair it it's not too bad as long as you know the downsides to it. So what we're going to do now, we're going to get it fired up, see how noisy it is and see if it actually works or not. Holy sh... Um, okay. Come on, focus. We've actually got a broken lead there, so we've got an exposed live wire on there as well. Now, this hasn't been used as yet. This hasn't been out. It's literally come out of the box in the house. It hasn't been used on anything as yet, so we've already got... Nice. Well, that's a pretty good start. I think um, maybe I'll speak to Amazon about that, see if we can get a replacement lead for that. But for the moment, we'll keep our fingers away from that. We'll get this filmed and see if it actually works. Right, filling loops on, or filling whips on, should I say, Foster Fit. They recommend that you use the filter end at the probe end. We're going to fire it up and see whether or not it's noisy. Now, you've got cooling fans in both the power supply and you've got a cooling fan in the compressor. So I'm going to put the mains on now, and this should then power up the power supply itself. Well, hopefully you can hear that. That sounds just like a PC fan. Bit of air coming out of there, great. So that's working. Got a green light there now. Don't touch any of this lot because they're live. That's also live, so that's even more sketchy. Right, so we've got two switches here. This is the main power supply to actually get the compressor to run. This one here is for a fan inside of this. It's a cooling fan to keep the actual unit at a reasonable ambient temperature. So we'll pop that one in first. Twenty-three point seven. Wow. Okay, that's noisy. It sounds like a jet engine taking off. Right. This is probably not necessarily going to be um, incredibly neighbour friendly. That's for sure. So the temperature you saw in there, the twenty-three point seven, that is the temperature in the shed at the moment. They reckon that these can run up to eighty degrees. You don't want to go above eighty degrees on the display there. That will be the actual temperature of the compressor itself. Now, in a lot of cases, a lot of people say that they do shorter fills and don't let the temperature go above, say, 30 degrees, 40 degrees or whatever. It just says in the instructions, do not let it go over 80 degrees. Now, that's 80 degrees Celsius. Most of the world uses Celsius. In any case, we're going to get this plugged in now. We'll see what the actual compressor itself sounds like under no load. So I'm going to put the compressor on without the fan just to get an idea of the noise. <laughs> Okay, got a bit of a rock to it, the feet probably want adjusting, so the actual compressor noise itself is not too horrific, the actual fan noise, the combined fan noise, that's pretty noisy, although it's quite a low drum, it's not a horrific noise, it's not like a router going or anything like that, it's more like a vacuum cleaner sort of noise, so it shouldn't um, be too horrific on the neighbours. The gauge on the top here, annoyingly, it's in megapascals, so one megapascal is 10 bar, so if you see 25 on your gauge, that's 250 bar. Right, let's quickly knock that off. Right, so that main switch is off. There's obviously a capacitor in here holding a bit of charge. That ran on for a little while, so that's now off. Hopefully, I'm not going to touch that for the minute. Let's pull the plug out. Dodgy as. Right, what we need to do now, we're going to pull the Ultimate Sporter apart. We're going to give that an inspection before we refill it. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, that Ultimate Sporter has been filled with my FX track pump. This beast, this is an antique one now. Now, this is on its last knocking, hence why I've gone over to a compressor. This has had no filtration on it. It had a little cartridge like this originally that was full up with silica balls. And now they all started to dis well, basically fell apart some years ago, so I ended up whipping it out. They all fell apart, got stuck in the fuel valve on one of the other rifles. But that Ultimate Sport has been filled with this track pump with no filtration on it at all for its whole life. Now, I put on the Cerakoted cylinder about two days after it was brand new. So that is a standard factory cylinder on there. It's just been Cerakoted. It's the same age as the gun. And this basically has lived up the farm for the last seven years. It's used regularly still, but it's actually empty now, and it's been empty for the last fortnight, three weeks. Now, it's been at atmospheric pressure for about three weeks. That may well mean that we've got signs of rust in there. So I'm going to move all this out of the way, and we're going to pull the Ultimate Sporter apart. Right, so the cylinder's off. There's no signs of any scale, any um, 
green verdigris or anything like that on the pot itself. There's nothing inside of the cylinder that's obvious, that looks like corrosion or anything like that. Now I've tried to photo it, absolutely can't get a decent picture of it. So you'll have to trust me on that, but I'm quite happy to actually refit this. I'm just gonna re-lube it, put it back together, and then we'll get the pump on and we'll see how long it takes to fill this from empty. Now, interestingly, you have to cock these when you fill them. Normally you'd use a dive bottle, give it a quick blast to seal the valve and everything else. I don't know whether the compressor itself will actually have enough pressure quickly enough to actually fill this even with it cocked. So it would certainly be interesting. We may well have to get the dive bottle out to just get that valve overcome with pressure before we can fully fill it. So we'll try, we'll put it back together, get it on the compressor and we'll time how long it takes. Right then, we're all connected up. So we've got the little fill loop on, filling whip, that's onto the end, foster fit straight on the end of the S510. Now, I'm very happy that the cylinder itself is in good condition. I would absolutely not recommend that you do what I'd been doing on that other pump. High pressure air is no joke, guys. You definitely need something of filtration on there. Something's better than nothing, but bigger's always better in this instance. Now, this will be swapped out for a better fill line, although I will keep this one, probably for filling the 510, so we can do some periodic sort of checkups. We'll see whether or not we're getting anything in the way of um, corrosion inside, see how often these filters need changing. But certainly from a nice stuff, we're going to get a better line with a better filter on there as well. So I'm going to fill this one up. We're going to go for 180 bar, so that's 18 megapascals on here i'm going to do it in a time lapse get the old stopwatch on and we can see from empty how long it takes and i need to quickly cock the rifle get the time lapse going Right, so we've got just under four minutes then on the old um, stopwatch. Two and a bit minutes, well nearly three minutes of that, we're getting it from zero up to the first 100 bar. So if you were doing short fills, or if you were running it from say 180 bar down to 100 bar, you're probably only looking at a minute or so to top it up. It's generated a bit of warmth, but not too bad. In most cases, you'd come back to that and you'd top it back up to your working pressure because of course it is warm at the moment. So as it cools down, we'll effectively lose some pressure in there and want to top it back up again. But I've just taken that up to 180 on the gauge here. By the time that's settled in, it's probably gonna be about 170 just over, which will be straight and sweet spot of this. Right, hopefully you can see here that I've dismantled the little filter media out of here. Now there is some staining on there already, which indicates moisture. It could well be some silicon oil out of the actual compressor itself. But in any case, without some fairly sophisticated test equipment, you're never really gonna know. But this definitely needs swapping out for a larger filter with some better media in there. Maybe even a molecular, oh, maybe even a molecular sieve type arrangement. That's harder to say than I thought it would be. Potentially going forward, that's definitely a good option. So this is the Tuxin branded one. These are often rebranded in the UK under different names. In fact, there's some companies that rebrand these with their own brand on. The power supply is horrific. That definitely won't comply to British standards. Broken cables on there, that's not great. However, if like me, you can deal with this and you know what you're getting for your money, then it's not really a problem. As I've mentioned, they have failed numerous British standards testing, and it's all related to the power supply, not the mechanical side of things. The actual compressor and the power bearing unit inside and everything else, and it's dealing with the high pressure air, has passed all the British standards testing that I can see so far. So I'm still not too upset. I need to chase them up about that. But if I haven't blown myself up or electrocuted myself before the next video, I'll see you then.